Hello everyone, today we're going to talk through a wizard build for the Daggerheart open beta playtest. We're going to start at level 1, talk through all the choices so that a newer player could easily play this character. Then we'll take it 2 through 10 to see how things will turn out. Please remember as we get started, make a skill check against that like button. I'm sure you'll succeed with hope, or at least you'll give me hope if you do succeed. Uh, for a wizard build, we're going to go with the, the experience system. There's not really skill rolls as such in this game but you do you can pull in your experiences so we're going to use that for this character we're going to make it a let's say a skill based character it's going to have a lot of support spells things out of the domain that are going to help the party the combat damage overall the ability to do hit points of damage to a single target uh, is not that great but we're going to trade that off against good utility for the party good control effects for the battlefield and we're going to Outfit our wizard with heavy armor. Uh, wizards have such low damage thresholds. You want this heavy armor. When they get hit for a good chunk of damage, the armor will typically reduce that by two categories instead of just one. So we can avoid taking lots of hit points and damage. There's nothing to stop our wizard from taking heavy armor, so we're actually going to make that part of our kit. Now, as we go through this build, we're going to use this experience system to get high rolls for out-of-combat what typically in D&D would be called skill rolls. And in combat, we're going to have a combination of control spells, and we're also going to have some healing for the party. So as we go through this build, it starts to really not feel like a stereotypical wizard. In Dungeons & Dragons, there's plenty of wizard builds that are mainly for support. You use spells like haste and fly to help your party do better. You do area effect damage with fireballs and things like that to clear the smaller monsters off the battlefield so that the rest of your party can focus on the big guys. You know, later in the game, you can use banishment, wall of force, polymorph, things like that to help control the combats. So we're familiar with that. That feels like a wizard. But then to say that that character is also going to be the best scout in your party, they're also going to be the rogue for your party, uh, just sorts, sort of feels a little bit strange. And it makes this character feel, uh, let's say, definitely different than the stereotypical D&D wizard. So this is going to be a combination of um, a scout, a thief, a wizard, and a cleric. Uh, that's also going to make this character the non-combat role expert. So in combat, there's going to be characters that are much better at dealing damage. But out of combat you may find that the whole party will just turn to this character and wait for the important roles to be made. And uh, I don't know if, if that's good for everyone. So just be aware, if you're playing this character, when it's time to go scouting, you'll be out front. When it's time to disarm a trap, you'll probably be the one who wants to disarm the trap. If there's a knowledge role to be made, you're the one going to be role-playing for the knowledge. So if you want to be the point person, that's, uh, this could be a great character for you. If you don't normally want to be the character that's kind of put in front of everything, then uh, maybe this type of character isn't for you. It's not like a typical D&D rogue where you can do some stuff and then sneak into the background. All right, so the build goals, we're going to try to establish hope and stress mechanics right away. We're going to focus on out-of-combat stuff. Knowledge <clears throat> and instinct are going to be uh, the main two skills, but we're also going to level up presence and finesse as much as we can. So... We're going to have high traits across all the stats. We're going to have support stuff to heal characters. We're going to have spells that move enemies around. We're going to have rest mechanics eventually. And we're going to focus on really this experience system and using high traits and high experience roles to succeed at just about anything we want in the game. For the Ancestry, there's a lot of different things we could do. Orcs, Elves, Galapas add proficiency to armor. We're not really going to go with a very high proficiency, so Galapas not the greatest for this particular build. Halflings are always great. Just wake up in the morning, give everybody hope, and then you have a little bit of control on your hope. You get to reroll ones, so it's a good choice for just about <clears throat> any character you want to build. Orcs, of course, make better use of armor. But for this particular build, we're going to go with the Furbolg. They have a chance to ignore stress. So we're going to activate things that take stress. We roll a d6, and on a 6, we don't have to take that stress after all. That's going to help this class as we, level, as we go through the levels. 
it's also nice for role playing. So now we're a furbolg. We're trying to be very calm. We've got this heavy armor, and that can lead us into some very specific role playing ideas. For community, you could pick a bunch of different communities. Whatever flavor you want for this character could be fine. Ridgeborn to give you maybe some more armor tricks. Orderborn's always good. Slyborn could give you some advantages in certain skill checks. Uh, but we're going to go with Wanderborn. And again, if we're trying to be the person who, out of combat and in role playing, is solving a lot of problems, Wanderborn just lets us solve another problem sometimes. You spend a hope, you reach into your pack, and you pull out something that's useful for the current situation, and you work together with your DM and decide what that is. So it's just another way for this character to sort of fill in for whatever is needed, whatever we might not have. So we'll take that as the community. So now we have a personality. We have this wandering furbolg named Pat. And Pat is going to be fully encased in heavy armor. The helmet is going to be completely closed in. We know it's a furbolg because maybe we see these cow-like ears sticking out or maybe some horns. But as far as the identity of the character, we're not going to know anything. And I would play this, this character in a way that I would never tell the party for the entire duration of the campaign. I would never reveal myself to be either male or female or any other identifying quality. If they asked, you know, any, any identifying questions, I would say something like, you know, I identify as the keeper of Codex Illuminator or something like that. And just make, make it a, a mystery as to what sort of... Uh, uh, what sort of creature I am. Uh, I, I would have kind of a deadpan voice. The, the book that I carry around would be a, a big part of the character, so we keep our spells in there. It's also got the answer to everything. So when we make these skill rolls and we check our experiences, we spend a hope, we spend a stress, we access the book, we look through it, we find the answers, and there's everything in there. So if you want to open a door or pick a lock or track a monster or figure out how to be sneaky, like the answer to everything that you want to do is somehow in this book. And uh, you can role play the book as well. Maybe the book is just a, a massive book that has teeny tiny writing. So there's like 90 encyclopedias worth of information inside this uh, in this book if you know where to look. So let's say you fail on a, on a uh, experience check or something like that, and you, you know, manage to roll a failure. Uh, maybe I just couldn't find it in the book. You know, you can role play that out. If you have a success with hope or a critical success, maybe you knew exactly where it was and you just kind of open the book and kind of use your deadpan voice. And yes, here in chapter 632 on page 1,872,000, it does say that this is the proper ointment to put on that wound. And just kind of, you know, uh, play through it like you're looking through the book or showing people where stuff is in the book. I, I see this character being uh, not necessarily outright annoying, but, but certainly playing into that whole, you know, I know everything if you ask me kind of a, kind of a flavor. All right, so that uh, brings us to the class and subclass. We're going to be a wizard. We're going to do School of Knowledge. It gives advantage on some knowledge roles. But we're, what we're really here for is the ability to spend stress to double our experience bonuses. And we're going to use that to sort of break the statistics of the game. Wizard, you get to pick a number. And when you roll your duality dice, if that number shows up, you get to clear a stress or gain a hope. So 23 out of 144 results will have any given number that you pick. Remember, one of the results that you could get is doubles of that number and I don't think you get double the benefit if you like let's say you pick two and you get double twos I don't think you get to clear two stress but you can tell me in the comments below if you feel differently if both duality dice roll your number does that mean that it triggers twice I don't think so but even so 16 percent of the time we're going to get that number to come up for my own psychology, I would pick a low number like two. If I roll a two, I probably fail the roll. So if I fail a roll, I still get a benefit out of it. And then it feels like your character's either going to succeed, they're going to get hope, or even if they fail, they're probably going to get something out of it. So 
uh, that's what I might do. If your team has some re-rolls in it, then you, you want to pick a higher number uh, because you're going to try to re-roll into higher numbers and maybe you get more of those uh, in a given sitting. Uh, I suppose, again, leave it in the comments how you think this works. If you roll a two and a five and that's a failure and you decide to re-roll it, did you still get to clear a stress because you rolled a two originally? Does that original roll count or does only the re-roll count? Now that I think about it, I guess re-rolls don't matter uh, because it does say when you roll your duality dice. So even if you re-roll them, you should probably get the benefit. Interesting. So maybe this is, uh, skill is even better than I thought. Anyway, uh, any number is just as good as any other number. So pick whatever you like, whatever makes most sense for how you think about the game. And uh, I, I must admit, I originally tried to build this wizard several different ways, combining the school of war and the experience system to to get a character that was both good at skills out of combat and also still pretty competent in combat but i couldn't really get that to work out what i ended up with was a character that was not good at either one and with the school of war if you want to create a character that does damage using the school of war just consider the fact that there's a lot of other characters that you could build that would be better. So why would you go School of War and build a worse version of a warrior when you could just build a warrior and be a better version of that than you would be with, uh, with, with School of War? Anyway, so I, I ended up not really finding something with the School of War that I thought was a great uh, build yet. I'm sure something will come out as we continue to play test this game. But anyway, with the School of Knowledge... We have a 1 in 6 chance with a f being a furbolg that we don't have to apply a stress. We have a 6.25% chance that one of our results is going to be a magic number. So statistically, 3 out of 10 rolls, we're either going to not use a stress or clear a stress. And that gives us some good mechanics in the game. For stats, we're going to use knowledge as our main stat. We're going to use finesse and instinct at plus 1. And we're going to give strength a minus 1. But we are going to be working with all of our stats as we level up this character. So we're going to have most of those stats as high as we can, we can get them. We'll take a wand and a tower shield. This character can take hits. We're going to be in heavy armor with a tower shield. But just remember, that heavy armor and tower shield is making up for our deficiencies with the thresholds. It's not meant to make us a tank, okay? So heavy armor does not make this character into a tank that should run to the front lines. It turns us into a character that when we do get hit, we can at least take less damage from those hits. Think of it that way. Here's the full plate armor. We see another picture of our little bovine friend kind of all wrapped up and, um, you know, we shouldn't even really be able to tell what kind of character this is. Just a bunch of heavy armor. Starting inventory, you can pick whatever you like. It's not really uh, much of a big deal. Play whatever, get whatever you want for your role playing. With domain cards, we're going to take Book of Ava. This one is, I think, the one you really need to have. The power push is excellent. You hit something in melee range, and you knock it out to far range. It's a great way to control the battlefield, push things away make them take their next turn the next time that monster gets an action token used it's just going to move back into combat with you so it wastes one of their tokens it, it, it does a little bit of damage but really it's about controlling the battlefield uh, maybe you have a character that does whirlwinds or things like that and the gm's not putting a bunch of monsters around that character you can also use this position yourself correctly and knock a monster back into range so that your area effect uh, characters get more damage done. So that could be a fun way to use this as well. Uh, lots of different uses for the power push. Ice spikes, uh, if there's a group of enemies, there's a type of adversary in the game where it's a bunch of little guys that group up together, and this will allow you to hit groups of enemies the Book of Tafar, the Wild Flame, does give you an actual area effect where you can target multiple characters. So I, I like that. At level one, you can help clear out little groups, multiple characters. Magic Hand uh, allows you to do things at a distance, and that's always fun. 
And the mysterious mist allows you to put a small patch of mist on the field, and it's one-way fog. You can see out of it. Other things can't see in. If the GM wants to bring a monster within melee range, it'll enter the fog and be able to hit you. But at least for casters at range that need to be able to target you, or archers or something like that, uh, they won't be able to hit you through the misty uh, uh, mist. So I like it. I think it's a good way to keep your character out of combat. It's a, a nice thing that you can do on your turn that helps, that doesn't give the GM fear. The other thing you could do instead of taking the Book of Typhar, you could take um, Reassurance, which allows rerolls. That's a really good skill. I, I think it's powerful. I, I think selfishly for keeping this character alive in the early levels, I like the, the Mist and I like the Wild Flame to, to do area effect damage. But uh, I could also see taking the, the, the reroll skill. For experiences, when you're making a level one character here, <clears throat> if you're playing in a one shot, you can pick whatever skills you like. If you're playing in a campaign, how you pick these experiences is going to be more important for this character than it is for most other characters. We really want to pick things that are going to allow us to make checks out of combat. Let's call them skill rolls, whatever you, however you want to think of them. But uh, we want to make a lot of those checks using these experiences, so they need to be relevant for how we want to play the character. I picked the first one as Master Sleuth, so we're a little bit Sherlock Holmes. We're an investigator. We want to find footprints. We want to, uh, in, basically for D&D, things like investigate, uh, perception, those kinds of things. Uh, we, we want to be able to do that, so we're going to give that a plus two. And we're going to take the other experience as Acquisition Expert. And that's going to be rogue type skills, hiding, sneaking, infiltrating, stealing stuff, sleight of hand, deception, whatever we want for Acquisition Experts, if we can role play it out and make it make sense. I think that should give us a very broad range of things to be, uh, again, an investigator, a scout, and a bit of a rogue for our party, and fill in all of those different concepts. Um, so at level one, level one characters in Daggerheart are all going to feel uh, pretty good. I mean, there's not a whole lot of bad choices you can make. The stats are pretty flat. The way the system works is pretty flat. So, you, you know, get in there with the character, have some fun, push some things around, support your party, and uh, get ready to move up. Level two. At level two, everything's going to change for this character in a hurry. We're going to get uh, experience leveled up, so we're going to take those experiences to three and two instead of two and one. We're going to level up the traits of knowledge and instinct. And again, instinct should be the things that are like investigation and perception. That's always been a very uh, important set of skills in Dungeons and Dragons, and I think it's still relevant for Daggerheart roleplay. So we're going to keep instinct as our top other skill besides knowledge. We're going to take the Book of Vagris, which is going to give us Rune Lock, um, Arcane Door, and Reveal. For experience at level 2, again, we want to pick something that we can use. So we've got our scouting down, we've got our rogue skills down. I said School of Charm. So now, if we're in a social setting and we need to make somebody our friend, uh, maybe uh, Pat is just sort of a sad and pathetic character and maybe not in the traditional sense of presence being you know attractive and leadership and commanding but more like uh, you know likable and sort of in a way that you feel empathy or feel sorry for the character but you could role play out uh, some some uh, social let's say charisma based concepts with this character and get this experience to kick in in keeping with the idea that we've got this big book that has everything in the world written in it, we say, okay, we're studying School of Charm, call it Chapter of Charm, whatever you want to. We don't really know how to be, uh, uh, let's say, interesting to people, but we know how to look it up in the book and, and figure it out as we go along. So, it, again, it goes in with the role play of the character. If you want to pick something different for your experience, feel free, but I think like a social charisma type thing is, is fitting here. In the Book of Vagris, the reveal can be uh, really interesting. It depends on how you and your GM decide to work with this. Reveal, you make a check, 
And if there's anything hidden, you get to see it. So you can make a check. Don't use any hope. Don't trigger any experiences. Just roll a check. So you throw out the duality dice. And you got a 3 in 10 chance. Well, I, I guess you're not using stress so the fur bulb doesn't kick in. But, uh, you know, one of the dice r results comes up to your magic number. You get to clear a stress or gain a hope. So you could be making reveal checks frequently. And over time, you would clear stress or gain hope, whatever you want to do with that uh, rolling of your, of your ideal number. So this gives you kind of a free roll. And you can generate fear and give the GM a bunch of fear doing this. So it's not completely without consequence. I, I think in the game terms, there's, there's uh, some context that says if it's not a roll with stakes, like if failure doesn't mean anything, just give it to them. So I think a lot of times your GM would say, there's nothing hidden, don't roll. You know, you're automatically, I'm just going to tell you now you're going to fail. There's no stakes. I'm not going to let you just run around rolling reveals. But, uh, you know, if, if, if the circumstances allow it and it makes sense, it's a way for you to generate a role and potentially clear your stress. Anyway, between the experience and the traits, we're going to have much better uh, results there, too. All right, at level three, we're going to get another stress that we can use, and we're going to level up the traits of presence and finesse. We're going to take the Book of Nori, and Fireball, I think, is underpowered. Even if you're taking all of your proficiencies, Fireball scales with proficiency. It affects a, a little patch uh, up to very close range, which isn't bad, but it's also not fantastic. It, it doesn't feel that big or powerful. And again, we'll have to see in playtesting, maybe that's better than I think. But, but Fireball seems underwhelming. Tether, on the other hand, I think is the reason we take this for the rest of the game. Uh, being able to lock something down, and especially the part where it says you can tether a flying creature and basically ground it, it's, there's combats where I could see, even once this is in the vault, you would pull this out of the vault and hit something with a tether, and that could be one of the biggest control turns that you could take. So I think it's worth having this just for the, for the utility of tether for the whole game. Level four, we're going to take a proficiency. Uh, take our second proficiency here, and we'll take the traits and level up our agility and strength and get those. So we've uh, leveled up every trait now, all six of our traits within this first tier. We'll take the Book of Grin. We'll get Deflection, uh, Lock, and Wall of Flame. The Wall of Flame is pretty interesting. That can section off a piece of the battlefield between any far two far points. So you make a circle around yourself at far, and you can pick basically half the circle to be covered by the wall of flame. You can draw it at an angle up through the circle between any two far points. So basically, if there's characters that need to get into melee that haven't yet got to melee, you can put them on the other side of the wall, make them take damage as they get to you. Then you use Book of Ava, knock them back behind the wall again, they take damage, and then when they walk through it again, they take damage. So bouncing things back and forth on that side of the wall could be fun so the wall itself isn't that impressive but the ability to you know generate future effects is is interesting so in combat our pat here isn't going to do much weapon based damage we're not often going to be using our wand mostly we're going to be using ava ice shards or helping the party Later on, we'll get Fireball. It's going to scale badly with this character because we're not going to take a lot of proficiency, but here at low levels, it does work pretty well. And we've got Wall of Flame. If you want to take Reassurance, that could help if you've got that. And uh, that kind of... Uh, we're more of a non-combat character, right? So in combat, we're just helping out, controlling, and that's it. For uh, out of combat, our Master Sleuth is now at plus three. Acquisitions Expert is plus two. Our stats went up. We can spend a stress to double those to six and four. So for most of our scouting and roguelike abilities, we're going to be either at plus six or plus four on those skill checks if we choose to use a stress. On certain knowledge checks, we'll get another D8 advantage. And, uh, you know, the party can always burn hope to give us advantage on other roles. So these skill checks are going to be high. We're often going to have somewhere around let's say seven to 10 bonus 
on those rolls. And if we get advantage beyond that, we could easily be in the 10 to 15 range for what we actually put on top of our roll. So let's say at this level, DC 16 would be the average, the normal um, check. And uh, if you can already put plus 12 on top of that, you almost can't fail these rolls for an average roll. Um, if we're taking a hit in combat, again, we're going to use our armor to try to reduce that by two categories whenever we can. Whenever we take stress to activate our experience, always remember to roll that furball uh, D6, and there's a chance that we don't have to use the stress after all. Even if we're taking a stress for combat, you know, we, we take like a 15 hit points of damage, we use our armor, we reduce that down to stress. Uh, okay, we still get to roll the Furbolg roll. In terms of role playing, this character is never going to panic. No matter how bad it gets, I would always play this character deadpan. So, so let's say somebody fell down in combat, they needed to be healed, maybe you've got something to, to go over and help them, uh, something like that. Uh, it works a little bit differently in D&D, &D, healing fallen characters, but, but let's say somebody's in trouble, restrained, whatever, you go to help them. Uh, don't panic. You know, okay, I'll come over here. I think there's something in my book that tells me how to deal with this. Let me look it up, and I will see if I can help you become unrestrained. I, I, again, I, I just I have this funny image of this character just walking around in heavy plate mail, just kind of plodding around, chilling out. All right. So if your GM does a lot of objective-based combats, and in, in Warhammer 40K, there's this idea that you always have to play to the objective. I used to play that game a lot when I was younger, and I can't tell you how many times I won. In terms of 40K combat, I lost the combats. More of my troops were dead. I didn't, you know, let's, let's say win the combat. But I played the objective and won the scenario, and that would get you enough points to, to get a win in the game. Uh, so some, sometimes in D&D, that's fun, right? Let's say you go into a combat, and the whole point, the whole thing that you're trying to do is get the necklace from the necromancer before he casts the ritual. Let's say he has to pour some blood out of this uh, necklace. He's got a, some kind of vial around his neck. So he's doing the ritual. He's got his arm raised. You walked into the room. And now you got to get this vial from him. This, uh, this ability to lock an object in place, it's crazy. You just walk in, you lock the necklace in place. If he wants to move the necklace at all, it takes a, a check. They, they have to use abilities or, uh, let's say, succeed in order to move the necklace at all. Can't pour the blood out. And if you want to keep wearing the necklace, you also can't get away. You can't walk because the necklace is frozen in place. So for an objective-based combat, this, this is really overpowered. <laughs> um, l let's say uh, somebody steals something from you. They, they take your pouch of gold and they're running down the street. You just go, okay, stop. And your pouch of gold just freezes right there. And the, the, the urchin that took it or the thief or whatever they're not going to get away with it. That object is just frozen in space. So things like this are going to make this character really shine. Uh, in, in like the drudgery of combat when you're just trying to do hit points to characters, it's not that great. But these mechanics of you know using the wall, using the area effects, locking objects in place with that spell really can change how the combat works. Okay, level fives through seven, second tier here. We're going to take another experience. We're going to call this Master of Geography. Teleport spell, it, you have to make a spell check when you cast it to see if you land in the right spot. And if you're not familiar with a particular area, you take some penalties. So teleporting somewhere you've never been before is hard. But with this wizard, if we have a relevant experience and we can find a way to role play that and trigger it and use it, um, really the, the teleport spell becomes even more powerful. So I said Master of Geography, so even if we've never been there before, maybe we know something about it, we can trigger this experience and help teleport our party somewhere they've never been. Uh, we'll level up experiences and traits. Again, that's our main thing we're going for. We'll take the teleport spell. We'll swap out with the Book of Cytil as needed. Level 6, we're going to take another stress slot. 
We'll level up the traits of presence and finesse. Again, keeping up with all those traits. We'll take the restoration and we'll put away the Book of Nori. We can always pull it out of the vault when we need it. At level seven, we'll take our subclass upgrade and we'll take the last two traits and take strength and agility up again. We'll take the Book of Homet and put it in the vault. That book is uh, zero cost to take out of the vault. So if we need the stuff that's on that particular domain, we'll just pull it out and use it. The primary role for this character through this tier is just control and support. We're going to use our turns to manage the enemy position, use the Wall of Flame, use the Book of Ava the same way we've been using it, and uh, also have some of these other spells and skills uh, to control the battlefield. We've got healing now. It's a number of tokens equal to our spell cast, which should be four or five if we have the Knowledge Relic. So we can heal eight to ten hit points per day for our party as a wizard. So that's nice. We'll help them. And, and then again, if somebody's got two hit points of damage and you take a rest, and that means that they can clear stress and clear armor, and then you can just give them back those two hit points, that makes your rests a lot more effective, makes it so that you can get through more combats in a day. So it's a nice little support mechanic. Um, out of combat, by now our Master Sleuth can be plus five. We got it to plus four, plus three because of the leveling up of our experiences through uh, through leveling up. But we also got a plus one from our subclass, so we add that to Master Sleuth and we have a plus five. By leveling up our traits, it means that not only do we have these good experiences that we can double, we also have relevant traits for anything. So if it's a social setting, our presence is high. If it's a rogue thing, our finesse is high. If it's tracking or investigation, our instinct are high and uh, knowledge for anything that we might want to remember. So we've got stats covered, we've got roles covered, and uh, there, again, this reveal spell can be used to help find hidden things, but also to occasionally clear stress if your GM lets you do that. Levels 8 through 10 uh, get another experience. Uh, I put in Cowabunga. Anything with a bovine pun, at this point it's just role playing. I don't know that any more experiences can be made relevant, so pick whatever you want. Our level 8 level up, we're going to take the subclass and the traits for knowledge and instinct. The reason we're going to level up subclass first, it gives us plus one to two different experiences, and it's the same as leveling up our experiences, so we might as well take the full subclass and get those benefits as well. We're going to take Haven as a spell, and we're going to swap that out for Grin. Uh, Haven is nice. It's like in D&D, the Leoman's Tiny Hut or the Morden Canaan's Mansion. It lets you summon up a place for your party to rest, which is very nice. And if you do, then you get three rest actions. It's a lot of stress to bring this out of the vault, so pretty much feels like you have to keep this. If you wanted to have a different book in there, for most of the day and then like on your last short rest of the day swap it out for Haven we could do that too but you want Haven out and ready to go before we take our long rest for the day so that we have a place to to put the party up and uh, you can highly customize what that looks like it could be a castle a tower a, a, a spa with you know hot tubs whatever you want it to be it could be it could be anything it's fun a little bit of role-playing but it, we could do there Level 9, we're going to level up our experiences again, the traits of presence and finesse. We're going to take Book of Ronin. We'll put Teleport away. We can pull it out whenever we need it. And then for level 10, we'll take, I don't know, proficiencies, armor slots, two more stress, whatever you want to take here. Level 10 is really open. Maybe two stress slots is the best thing to take, but uh, yeah, whatever. It, it's, it's, it, the, you can take whatever you want here because it's the last level and... There's nothing that we must have. For, no, uh, for the 10th level domain, we're going to take Stunning Sunlight, and we're going to keep that equipped most of the time. The ability to hit several targets and stun them, it's not linked to proficiency, so whatever damage it does is going to be better than we can do on our own without proficiency, so it, uh, it gives us some better options. We're going to put Restoration in the Vault. Now, the way Restoration is worded it says after a long rest you put tokens on this equal to your spellcast trait 
It doesn't say that it has to be active or equipped or whatever. So I believe that even if it's in the vault, it should still get the tokens. You go through your first combat or two of the day, and when your party actually needs the healing, then you can pull that restoration out, use the tokens off of it, and put it back. So where to put the experience? This is going to be something that, if you're playing this character, you'll have to answer for yourself. Uh, sort of the obvious thing to do if you just want to continue to overpower the rolls. Uh, just keep putting the experiences in the same two things and have a plus 7 in one and a plus 5 in the other. When you double those, you'd have a plus 14 and a plus 10, and that is really game-breaking in terms of the statistics. If you're trying to make a high-level roll, a normal DC is 18, really high DC might be 25. And if you can already put up a plus 14 and get advantage on that and, and be almost auto-success on a DC 25, uh, that's just crazy. I don't think uh, I don't think that's the way that I would play this. So again, let's look at a plus five. If we have a plus five, we can use uh, we could double that to a plus ten. Then we could use our stat. So let's say we have four or five on our stat. A plus ten, plus four gives us a plus fourteen against an average DC of eighteen. That means anything four or better is going to be a success. If you look at all the results that you could get with 2D12, there's two results that will give you a three. The only result that gives you a two is a one and a one, which is a critical success. So that we don't have to worry about. So there's two results out of 144 that fail. That's a 1.4% chance of failing if we use a stress to activate and get a plus 10. So at that point, it's enough. I mean, are you really gonna continue to level up these experiences just to take that chance to zero. Uh, I don't think that's what I would do with the character. So you can end up with a plus three and a plus five at the second tier. And then with the third tier, you could make two other skills plus threes. You could end up with a plus five, a plus five, and a plus three. You work it however you want. I like geography at least as a third relevant experience. Again, to make those teleports nice and make it so that you can pretty much teleport wherever you want, use your experience, and get, I won't say a guaranteed success, but a really high chance of a success of teleporting where you want to go. All right, so in, in the level 8 to 10 gameplay, the, the primary role is still control and support. The damage that we have, we only have two proficiencies, so we're not going to be a damaging character. However, there are spells that we use to control that will also be doing damage. So we will get in some damage, but mainly we're here for the control. Book of Ava is still relevant. Stunning Sunlight is very relevant. We have this stable portal spell now that we can teleport across the battlefield during combat if we had to. We can cross hazards. There's an old fallen bridge and we have to figure out a way across it. Well, just teleport across it with this uh, stable portal. Um, we have a, within our Subclass, we have the specialty that allows us to bring things in from the vault for one less uh, stress once per short rest. So we really can swap out a lot of these different domain uh, things pretty easily. A lot of them are too cost to swap in, but knowing that we could swap that or have that down at one stress, it, it's really not too much to ask to spend one stress to be able to pull out a tether and slap it on an opponent and pull them out of the sky. Uh, as the adversary damage scales, our armor does become less useful to manage big hits. So if we're level 2 and we get hit for a big hit, that's like, you know, 22 points of damage, and we can reduce it by 14 with our armor, that makes a big difference, right? When we're at a higher level, a big hit is like 47, and reducing it by, you know, let's say 18 with our armor by this time, really isn't changing that much. We're probably still taking three hit points of damage from that one. So armor becomes less relevant as we go along. So we really have to be out of combat as often as we can. We may have to pull in that mist and we do have to rely on other people in our party to be able to tank those hits and keep things off of us in combat. In combat, when we generate hope with our skills, I think with this character, if we enter combat with not much hope, we're going to just try to store that hope so that we can trigger experiences out of combat and do our role there the best possible. Uh, we can also use stress to power up skill rolls. 
and uh, using those experiences to their max potential. Um, for me, I would have to put some reminders in front of me. This, there's a lot of stuff to manage with the wizard. The first thing is this magic number. Let's say I picked three for the day. I, I could see where I'd be making a lot of rolls and I'd be getting threes and then I'd go back later and I'd be like, man, I forgot to activate that ability when I got that three, you know. And it, I wouldn't want to constantly be trying to retcon rolls that I forgot about. So personally, I'd have to have a reminder to look for all these things. And uh, you also have your subclass that when you spend hope, you get to reroll, you get to roll and maybe you don't spend the hope. You get the furbold D6 when you roll that maybe you don't, use a stress. You get the magic number. When you get your number, you clear a stress. So there's just a lot to remember. I might make a reminder to put in front of me. Uh, I like this character being the master of chill. We're going to keep four out of the six stats high. Agility and strength, you know, we'll lose some agility for being in heavy armor. Strength is never that good because we dumped it at the start of the game. Um, but still, we, we still leveled those stats up. We should have a plus one in both those stats, even with the penalties. So we don't have any bad stats, bad traits. So we should be able to out-track, out-think, and out-observe just about any character in the game. Rogues don't get better stuff for roguing. Uh, really, uh, some, some, kind, some tricks to get, uh, let's say, escape or infiltrate with rogues uh, are better. They get more stuff around the hidden condition, which is better. But just in terms of straight-up rolling, like unlocking a lock or disarming a trap, this character doubling experiences is going to outpace anything that a rogue can do, at least as far as I see it. Um, and it does break the mechanics in the game. Again, Daggerheart's sort of performing in a pretty flat range. But when you could take a bonus of five and have a high trait, you are already got a good chance to succeed. And then if you just add another plus five on top of that, you go from a 64% chance to succeed to a 96% chance to succeed. And it really sort of makes everything a success. Now, how much does that change the game? Uh, I don't know that it changes the game that much overall. So imagine that every time you wanted to open a lock or disarm a trap, you just succeeded. Uh, I don't know that that changes the game that much because it's not like you can auto defeat a dragon or something like that. There's still going to be challenges that your party has to deal with. Uh, you'll just be much better at getting through the out of combat stuff. So the, in, in terms of math, the ability to double your experiences is not good. That, that's not good. Uh, but I don't know how much of the game it actually affects. Um, again, this is just a reminder to all the different things that you have that might come up. And then as a player, I think in the hands of the wrong kind of player, this character could be really annoying uh, because you'll just be doing almost everything out of combat and still have things to do in combat. And, uh, you know, you'll get accused of, of, of having hero syndrome and trying to take all the credit for everything. But I think if you sit back and, and play this character as... Again, in my mind, this, this, this chill furball who st kind of stays in the background, let the party role play, and when a skill check needs to be made, they look to you, and you just kind of mope up and open up your book and succeed at the skill check and then go back into the background. Uh, you could play this character with great success, help out your party a lot without stomping all over the role play. So I think that's kind of important to know. And then in the end, just the question, you know, this is a wizard. It's a combination of a rogue, ranger, paladin, cleric. If you think of the D&D &D stereotypes, it's got wizard type control spells, can succeed at rogue abilities, ranger abilities, perception, social skills, has healing abilities like a cleric, which is, uh, it's crazy that this much stuff can all go into one character. But uh, yeah, we could easily beat all the best skill roles in the game. And the trade-off is we're just not going to do combat damage. I think a party with several of these characters wouldn't be useful, but one character in a party of four or five certainly is going to make things a lot easier out of combat. So that's our skill wizard. That's the first character we've built that doesn't focus on proficiency and doing damage. So we see that we can, in some cases, build a character without using those standard skills.
Here we can take a quick look at this character built out all the way to level 10. Evasion is horrible at 4. <clears throat> the armor's pretty good at 19. We've still only got 3 armor slots and the thresholds are pretty bad, so try to avoid getting hit. If you do get hit, use this 19 armor to try to drop it from severe to major or major to stress. But if you're already just taking one hit point or possibly even you know two hit points with higher damage, just leave it alone and take those hit points. Use your armor wisely. We've got nine stress. With this build, we've taken two additional stress slots with the level 10. Traits across the top, knowledge five, presence three, instinct and finesse are four. That's gonna allow us to do good scouting, knowledge, rogue skills, just about anything we want. The experiences, 5, 3, 3, 3, that's what I recommend. Uh, Master Sleuth at 5, Acquisitions Expert at 3, School of Charm at 3, and Geography at 3. That gives us a broad range of things we can succeed in. Scouting skills, rogue skills, social settings, and really nailing those teleports when we want to go somewhere we've never been. In terms of the starting books, uh, I would start with the Book of Ava out. Haven, you could start with something different earlier in the day and swap this out later. Stunning Sunlight, I would always keep in. It's 4d20 damage, which is really good. And on a failure, they get stunned, and the GM has to use fear to remove the condition. So this is super powerful for control. And the damage is really good, considering that we don't have proficiency anyway, and we'll be able to roll 4d20s with, uh, with it. So for the cost of one hope, this is really what we're going to do most of the time in combat. We've got the <clears throat> Book of Vagris ready for this arcane door revealing. And we've got the Book of Ronin for the stable portal that we might want to use in a combat situation. And we've got plenty of stuff in the vault. Again, tons of different stuff that we can use. This tether to pull things out of the sky. Um, deflections, time locks walls of flame, whatever we want. Tons of stuff over here ready for us to pull out as needed. So that gives you an idea of what the character could look like at level 10. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, pass the word along if you like these kinds of builds and want to give ideas to other players or even you know let your GM take a look at them, please send them over here. I would appreciate that. Hit that like button on the way out if you didn't hit it on the way in, and I sure hope to see you in the next build.